One of the main points for the success of Netflix's Baby Reindeer story lies in the fact that it's based on the real-life story of Richard Gadd, who plays the role of Donnie Dunn. But being based on a true story is not enough for a story to succeed, or even for something to be good now, is it? And what I see people commenting on the internet is precisely about that isolated point. But this is just one out of six elements that together form this monster that is the Netflix series Baby Reindeer. And the fifth of these other elements is something people always tell you about, but never explain exactly how it works. Well until now. From the moment the series begins until it ends, Baby Ranger grabs your attention and makes you identify with characters that I, at least, never thought I identify with in the way this series resonated with me. And watching this show took me on a journey back to the past when I was in New York studying to become a director. And not only were all the technical knowledge I saw and learned there applied very well here in the show, but there's a specific moment in Baby Ranger that was very similar to something that almost happened to me. So what are these other five elements that make Baby Reindeer be the success that it is? The first of these other five elements and the second in our overall list is, obviously, the script. Richard Gadd, the creator of the series and the real person who went through all of that, could have simply thought about what happened to him in a manner of how it started, how it developed and how it ended, and exposed these events in this kind of chronological progression, but that's not always good enough to hold the audience's attention, especially on a platform like Netflix, whose algorithm defines the success of a series through the number of users who binge-watched the production, so he had to be creative in capturing the audience's attention. That's precisely why there is room for a prologue within the structure of a script, which in the case of Baby Reindeer is the moment when we see him trying to report Martha to the police for the first time, and questioning himself whether he'll succeed or not when we don't understand the context of that scene. That makes us, as an audience, question what happened before, why he's so reluctant, who the hell hired this guy to be a cop, and most importantly, it makes us a promise. If we keep watching, we'll understand all of this. And the way he decided to expose these events is so well planned that when we reach this moment again, after understanding what led him here, we have a connection to the most important event of his life and the show, which is what happens to him in that flashback episode. So not only did Richard have the balls to adapt the life story of his lowest point, but he also had the nerve to think like an author, like a storytelling artist, to take a step back and think, okay, I'm gonna plan a way to tell this story in the most interesting and impactful way possible. Because that's exactly what a narrative structure is for, so you can have tools at your disposal to make the audience suffer, <laughs> and make them go through all the ups and downs so that all these events have their due importance. And also because we've reached the third item on the list of the six reasons why this Netflix series was a success. The author had the courage to exercise his worst demon in the format of a good story. And if there's one philosophy that I truly believe in and carry into my own writing, it's this line I saw in the movie Stuck in Love, which says, A writer is the sum of their experiences. And isn't that literally what the author of Baby Reindeer is doing here? However, just these three points are still not enough to tell a good story. Perhaps this would be the case in writing a book, but not for an audiovisual work. The fourth reason for the show's success, which is also related to all the storytelling aspect of the thing is the direction. This series makes you laugh when you need to laugh, it makes you nervous when you need to be nervous, makes you tense at the right moment, makes you ecstatic along with Donnie, and makes you even feel sorry for the crazy Martha, and thanks to its good storytelling, makes you understand a bunch of unique characters that I personally usually avoid stories about because the authors generally don't focus on the main thing which is a story, but rather on preaching a message to the audience. Donnie is a sexually confused character, unsure if he's bi or gay, he dates a trans character, he uses drugs, he's a weird eccentric artist. In other words, this show had all the possible elements to be considered woke, but at no point you feel like the series is lecturing you or trying to give you a moral lesson or basically just treating you like an idiot. An example I can give on the show's effect- a good example I can give on the show's effectiveness- effectiveness- Effectiveness. effectiveness. An example I can give of the series effectiveness. Okay, there we go. In putting you in the shoes of the characters is a moment when Donnie is exiled in his girlfriend's house. It sort of prevents her from leaving her own house too, out of fear that Martha will find them and attack her again. But me watching this, knowing she's a trans character, I thought, damn, she must have fought so hard to be able to go out in public accepting herself the way she wants, just for this guy to come now and say she has to stay home for fear of someone seeing her. And this exact argument is used in a discussion between them and it made me pause the show to acknowledge that they never rubbed all of that in my face. I simply connected to the character with what they showed me. And that's the sort of thing that only happens in a well-told story. So kudos, because it was a well-told story that made me feel empathy for a type of character that normally 
point doesn't affect me at all. The next point that helps Baby Reindeer be the success it was is the cinematography, aka the direction of photography. This is the point I mentioned at the start of the video, and this is a point that's very hidden in plain sight, and many people know it exists, but don't know exactly what it's for beyond creating cool shots to look at, which this series has plenty of as you can see on the screen. What many people don't know is that cinematography or DOP is not just a visual way to make beautiful images, but rather the greatest narrative tool of a film, series, animation or video game cutscene. Within cinematography, there's a bunch of rules, and one of them that we consciously plan to touch the audience's subconscious is the quadrant system. Let's take this scene from episode 6, where Donnie goes to confront Martha at her house, and he tries to set a trap to report her to the police. Here we see them in this wide shot where Donnie is on the right side of the screen, and Martha on the left. So. The quadrant system works as follows. Imagine there's a vertical and a horizontal line cutting the screen. These are your quadrants. Unconsciously, we understand that whoever is on the right side of the image is the person who has control of the situation. The right side is what we would call the dominant side and whoever is on the left side is at the mercy of the other. The left side is the submissive side. So imagine we have a father and a son, a detective and a suspect, a teacher and a student. Most, if not every time, the authority figure is set on the right side of the screen, but depending, of course, on the scene's context within the story and how the director actually wants or knows how to frame it. This is more of a guideline, a suggestion, that's why I said rule, but that's basically the gist of it. And this dominance and submission vary according to the lower and upper quadrants of each side, or whether the character is in the close-up or in the background, or if it's a lower angle looking up, or if the character is right in the middle of the screen. There are hundreds of possible combinations to manipulate the audience's understanding of the story with this technique. But in Baby Reindeer, here's what they did. Donnie is on the right side of the screen, right? Because he caught Marta by surprise and confronted her, so he's the dominant one at this point. And if the camera were to close in on the frame, he should still be on the right, right? However, look at where he is, and when this switches back to Martha, she's on the right. This causes an unconscious discomfort in the audience because it's visually counterintuitive, right? Which you, watching this, probably didn't know what that strangeness was, or simply overlooked it, but I'll tell you, Martha is the one who really has control of the situation because she has an ace up her sleeve. That's why she's on the right side. At the end of the dialogue, in fact, when the shot widens, Martha breaks the line and ends up on the right side of the screen. And then, in the next scene, we see the consequences of Donnie's action and we find out that Martha was recording everything he said and contacted the police before him. And at the moment he receives the news, where is he on the screen? On the left side. Because that's when he realizes that Martha is a beast he hadn't learned to fully decipher and he had underestimated her. And all of this happens right under our noses since we're stuck in Donnie's perspective. We only know what he knows and we discover new information along with him. He didn't know Martha was recording everything and neither did we, but the authors did. And they planned it to be exactly like this because the production of such a thing goes from the script to the hands of the director and the DOP, then they break down the script scene by scene into a storyboard, draw each scene and imagine how each character will be photographed scene by scene, shot by shot, then they go to the location they intend to shoot and take photos based on the storyboard to see if it makes sense and decide on the camera configuration, like which lens to use, they find the marks on the ground and do what we call the blocking of the scene, like how far the actor will walk and the timing for the lines and that kind of thing, and after all that, after some necessary and specific adjustments for each moment is made, a shot list is created to know the setup of each equipment and member of the team, where the camera will go, where the actor will go, the mic guy, the lights, so when they get to the location, they look at the list and see, okay, first of the list today is the medium close-up shot of Donnie, and everyone prepares themselves to film everything as efficiently as possible because they know what to do since it was planned beforehand, because each department has to know what to do for each scene, and every time that you watch something and you see a cut, now you know that there was all of this preparation behind it every single time. Nothing is done without being thought out, waiting for inspiration to strike, or writing freely. Everything is meticulously planned for you, the consumer, to have the best possible experience from the comfort of your home or the movie theater. And the last factor that contributed to the success of Baby Reindeer was what you've probably tried to guess throughout the video, the acting. And man, I have really nothing to say. This is something that you need to see to understand how monstrous the acting of these two protagonists is. But what I'll say is, I took an acting course for film and TV back in 2018, and one of the projects of this course was to prepare a monologue 
dialog where we would be directed by the teacher. And man, it's one hell of a job not only to memorize the text, but to know which emotions to activate in which sentence and how to transition from one emotion to another to create these highs and lows in the text structure in a natural way without seeming like you're playing pretend, which is a very wrong misconception people have of actors, that they're pretending to cry or they're pretending to be angry. What you see on screen are real emotions, only bad actors appear to be playing pretend. So what I did in this course was the monologue that Will Smith does about his father in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and with the guidance of the teacher during rehearsal I managed to feel like I was going to cry to the point where my voice cracked and as you can see in the clip I'm gonna show you. In this clip my acting coach was teaching us about how to use a line in your scene as a trigger to ground you in the main emotion of dialogue. It's in Portuguese but I subbed it. Here you go. Pegarem ela como gatilho, sabe? Pra você buscar emoções. Isso é bem legal também de fazer. Que é o que a gente tá fazendo agora. Fala a frase que você vai te ajudar. Olha pra câmera. Mas tava bom o que você tava fazendo. Eu tava tentando parar de Mas usa, vai, vai, usa a frase como âncora. Tá. Pra levar pra onde você tem que ir. Esse é o gatilho. Esse, essa é a técnica. Uma frase chave que tá dentro do seu objetivo. Você quer fechar uma porta. Você pode rir de nervoso também. Eu sei que você está rindo aqui por causa de nós, um pouco, né? Estou rindo mais desconforto. Então, está desconfortável, que a situação do ator é desconfortável, você está sendo exposto para os outros, né? E tem a crítica pessoal, estou sendo bom ou não estou sendo bom. Mas use essa técnica, a frase. Você escolheu uma frase, na verdade, eu escolhi para ti, mas acho que seria essa frase, né, para é, você. É a frase do... É a frase do monólogo. Né? Por que que ele... Por que, que ele não me quer? Por que, que ele não me quer? Use isso na repetição para levar você para todos esses lugares que você elencou lá na frente, lá atrás. Né? De objetivos, de características e sentimentos. Tá? Não fique. Use ela e aí tem a pausa. Use ela e aí tem a pausa. Estão entendendo a importância? Vocês vão ver agora acontecer. Vai lá, eu não, vou, não cortei câmera. Vamos lá? Por que, que ele não me quer, cara? Por que ele não me quer? Por que ele não Por que ele não me quer? And this is something that felt so weird to me because it was really a feeling that came as if I were trying to vent that for real and I had to try to control myself to not cry and stay on script and it was a few weeks of preparation until I got to that point and that was a short monologue like one minute long or less and I'm not even an actor so here in the series the guy does a seven minute monologue and of course there are some cuts in the editing to show the audience and everything else as well as other camera angles of him but I don't doubt that his parts were recorded simultaneously with more than one camera because it would be very heavy to redo these takes for each angle because of the topics of the monologue and the emotions associated with it. So regardless of whether it's a long take or not, it's still an incredible effort. <laughs> I was floored when I saw this scene because I was thinking not only about what I learned on the acting course and the effort behind it to make this happen, but also that this is a real story and the guy is venting all of this for the whole world to see. Which brings us to what I wanted to tell you about something that happened to me that could have ended the same way it ended with Donnie in that flashback. In 2015, I went to take a filmmaking course in New York and one of my classmates was a guy whom I'll call DJ who was already an established film producer in the industry. And he wasn't a big shot or anything. If it were a tier list, he would have been a B-level producer or even lower. But since I and all the rest of our classmates were literally amateurs, he was like much bigger than us. And something that was obvious about him just by looking at him was that he was gay. But the problem obviously isn't that, but rather that he was extremely inappropriate because he always made a point of making some ambiguous comment about me in public. You know, that joke that isn't really a joke, that flirtation that isn't really flirtation, was he clueless or did he have a different kind of humor? Did he lack tact or is just because he was an artist and he was eccentric? That was kind of the reaction for 
for me and everyone around, and that grey area was his lair. However, as this type of person usually tends to be, he was extremely charismatic and knew how to say what people wanted to hear to make everyone like him. He had VIP access to the coolest places, allegedly knew all the coolest actors, there was always a contact on the street to get drugs if someone wanted, he was the guy who had a guy for everything, you know? And since that time I was already pursuing writing and as he had me on his radar, he tried to win me over by saying, wow, you write so well, you have a bright future in this field, your ideas are so original, send me that logline of the story so I can pitch it to a contact I have at Lionsgate, your book seems so good, give me your phone number, I want to pass your contact to a literary agent from Stephen King's publisher. And the funny thing is, he never mentioned what publisher it was, he always said Stephen King's publisher because he knew I was a fan of the guy, and there was one day when he, me and another classmate of ours who was also Brazilian were talking about a show we liked during a break between some filming and we were talking in Portuguese, but he heard the name of the series, Orphan Black, and he came near us talking loudly on the phone and we heard him say the name Tatiana, and that made us stop like, dude, no way, and he told us that that was Tatiana Maslany on the phone who was the lead actress of the show we liked, and he told us that she was on her way to participate in our film we were doing at that exact time, which was the week's exercise of the course. Yeah, sure. Such a hyped up actress at the time, who played more than 10 characters in the same show, is going to come to the ass end of New York to participate in the film of a bunch of students. In December, sometime later, he received a call from her saying she couldn't come because something unexpected came up. Of course. This guy even offered me a VIP screening of The Force Awakens saying that the director, J.J. Abrams, would be there along with the cast. And he made me this offer during my lowest point in the course, when I was like really vulnerable and sad and feeling defeated but that's a story for another video. What I meant to say is that the guy was locked in, you know? And then I was watching the show and seeing the producer praise Donnie and I just thought, God damn it, this is the exact same behavior DJ showed towards me back in the New York days. But in DJ's case, it was all lies, obviously. But then came the incident that made me even more connected to Baby Reindeer. We were at a party at his house. It wasn't really a party party, it was like more of a coincidental gathering that a bunch of classmates ended up there because his Airbnb was in an apartment near Union Square, and I was there because I had gone to a friend's place that I met in this course, whose Airbnb was the apartment below DJ's. We stayed there until late, people were drinking, loosening up, and the first couples of this course they were forming and started to leave, and with a few people around who weren't really paying attention to us, DJ approaches me and speaks in a lower tone. Where are you staying? It's in Harlem, right? It's so far from here. I don't think there are any more trains going up there at this hour. Why don't you stay here? There's a spare bed in my room. Then he puts his hand on my arm and like caresses my arm. Or if you want, you can just leave the spare bed as is. I think I never felt such a strong chill run down my spine. My friend who lived downstairs were sitting on said spare bed. He didn't hear anything he said, but he saw the way DJ touched my arm. Then my friend suddenly got up and came up with some bullshit, pulled me aside and we scudaddled the f*** out of there. And then we spent the whole night playing Smash Bros <laughs> and talking about DJ and what the hell just happened. I told him all this that I'm telling you now, and he told me that DJ made the same absurd promises to him too. This friend of mine, Joe, was an animator and DJ said he was going to put him at DreamWorks, at Pixar, and yada yada yada. After that, I never got close to the guy again and he also kept it to himself, but at the end of the course, when everyone's parents went to New York for the graduation ceremony, he saw my mom, came all friendly to introduce himself and praise me to her and make her all the promises that he made to me, and my mom, not understanding a word of English, just agreed with him and said, oh really, oh wow, until he left. Then she waited for him to go down a hallway and into a room, and just from seeing him talking to her, she got the vibe from the guy. Then she looked at me and said, that fat guy wants to fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> so, watching that flashback episode of Baby Reindeer was like peeking through the window of a parallel version of myself, where for some reason Joe wasn't there to get me out of the situation and for some another reason I didn't bail immediately. If you like this video, consider subscribing to the channel, my name is Caesar Turek, I'm a screenwriter, writer and writing mentor, and check out this video here where I explain with several examples what woke writing actually is from the perspective of a writer. Alright folks, thanks for watching and see you next time.